All right, welcome back, folks, to my review of Extreme Rules 2013 right here on WrestleRant. I am your host, the always amped Graham GSM Matthews. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for my full reviews of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network, from WrestleMania 1 through 30, Royal Rumble, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, every show from Extreme Rules to fucking Judgment Day coming up in a couple weeks. We got Extreme Rules 2013 today, Extreme Rules 2014 on Tuesday, and then starting Saturday, next Saturday, I'll be reviewing every Judgment Day event in WWE history. So a lot of fun, a lot of cool things coming up here in the channel in the weeks to come. But Extreme Rules 2013. I've said this before, I'll say it again, Extreme Rules is always awesome. Um, this year's installment, which I will not be reviewing in this um, in this series of reviews of Extreme Rules, because I usually wait about a year, Like that's kind of the threshold for me in, in order to review it in retrospect here on the show. So I don't want to review the 2015 installment. If you want my, if you want my thoughts on the most recent Extreme Rules show this, from this year, from last Sunday... Um, go to nextdayrowrestling.net for my full review of the show in written form as well as WrestleRant Radio, the audio version, whatever. There's a lot of different places to catch my thoughts in Extreme Rules. But Extreme Rules 2013 was no exception to that rule. Really enjoyed Extreme Rules 2011, 2012, 2010 was a good show too. 2013, another very good show. And you know, maybe it was as good of a show as it was because WrestleMania 29 was so goddamn bad. I did not like that WrestleMania at all. I mean... Hard to, I mean, it's not really hard to see why, and a lot of people share my thoughts, and I just, I thought very, WrestleMania 29 was very underwhelming, so maybe that took, maybe that's why I enjoyed Extreme Rules a lot more than, um, you know, it, as I did at that time, and I enjoyed watching it back too, it wasn't as strong as some of the other Extreme Rules shows that we would get in years to come, and in years past, but it was still a really good show, and it was great, if only for the fact that it was 10 times better than WrestleMania 29, which preceded it. But kicking off the show itself, Chris Jericho versus Fondango. Now, I wrote an article for HiddenRemote.com last weekend on the weekend of Extreme Rules talking about how, you know, the, the top seven matches or whatever that deserves stipulations from Extreme Rules in years past. Because like I talked about in my review of Extreme Rules 2012, and in case you missed it, already up here on the channel, cheap plug from yesterday, um, you know, there's a lot of matches from 2012 onward that were never given stipulations for whatever reason. One of the reasons why Extreme Rules was innovated was, was you know, now exists. Um, you know, one of the main selling points of that pay per view was was that every match in the show, not not most matches, not three fourths of the matches, every match in the show was given a stipulation of some sort. And of all the matches, I mean, I understand why they didn't give a stipulation to Brodus and Ziggler, um, or to Clay and Ziggler from WrestleMania or from Extreme Rules 2012 from the year prior. I get why they didn't give a stipulation to Rusev Truth and Xavier Woods from Extreme Rules 2014. I get that. But why not give a stipulation to Jericho and Fandango? They were obviously very much pushing this feud for, you know, coming out of Extreme Rules. They didn't really give it much hype going into WrestleMania. They had all of, like, two weeks' worth of build going into that match. It was a good match, but you could obviously tell they were holding back a bit. And they went more out on this show in a really, really good match that went almost 10 minutes. And Fandango, I mean, the guy is an amazing athlete. You know, I'll, I'll never uh, hide from that fact that the guy is a great in-ring talent. I just don't enjoy the gimmick. I didn't enjoy it when it first came into the company, and I don't enjoy it now. And they're trying to push it as, like, the babyface thing. Maybe there's some more life in that than what he was doing before, but the guy was dead in the water after this feud with Jericho ended. And it's not because Jericho went over, it's because Fandango got injured, and, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm 90% sure certain that he was going to win the Intercontinental Championship at Payback, and because he got injured, that was a no-go, unfortunately. So, he was pretty much dead in the water after this feud concluded, but, you know, although I was not a huge fan of the feud, they made the most of it, they had really good matches, and this was another, um, another really good encounter between the two from an in-ring standpoint. Fandango making it made out to look like an equal to Y2J after beating him at WrestleMania. So, a Really, really good matchup. Jericho, in the end, picks up the victory with a code breaker in midair as Fandango jumps off the top rope. So, nice stuff there. Jericho gets a much-needed victory. You know, a lot of people like to say, oh, Jericho never wins. He wins too much. It's always one or the other with him and, and the fans and whatever. Um, you know, he got more wins than some people give him credit for in his 2013, in, in his 2013 run. And this was one of them. Uh, th this was one of the wins that he got during his run there. Um, like I said, the feud was not great. And Fandango, you know, probably should have gotten over if they really wanted to continue his momentum, regardless of whether he was going to win the Intercontinental Championship or not. But they wanted to move Jericho. I mean, they never really ended up doing anything with Jericho. Aside from the match with Punk at fucking Payback the following month, which was great. But they never... 
I don't know, you, uh, in retrospect, you know, Jericho needed the win, but Fandango, why not have him beat him twice? You know, because Fandango needed the win more than Jericho did, but whatever. Going back to what I was saying before, a good match and a nice way of kicking off the show. Up next, for the United States Championship, Dean Ambrose defending against, or challenging for the belt, against Kofi Kingston in a pretty good matchup. Not a great matchup. I don't know if people were expecting, I mean, it's hard to remember now. I know it was two years ago, but I don't know if people were expecting, like, a barn burner of a belt between these two or whatever. And I was hoping they would have a rematch at Payback and some sort of stipulation matchup. And this was another match that could have benefited from a stipulation. And I know it wasn't given all the time in the world to be built up, unlike Jericho and Fandango, but um, you know, a ladder match or no disqualification or something would have been nice. I mean, but for whatever reason, though, they were not given a stipulation. And with it being a standard singles matchup, it was a pretty good bout. I really enjoyed it. Ambrose and Kingston have good chemistry together. And the crowd was very, this This was from, uh, the show emanated from St. Louis. They're not always a smarky crowd, but they were very much on the on the side of the shield all night long, including Dean Ambrose, who came up victorious, beating Kofi Kingston clean with no help from the other brothers of the shield to win the United States Championship. Now, of course, he would hold that belt for a year, do next to nothing with it, um, you know. So I, I wish they would have done more with that belt. They would have done... Uh, he, they would have had him do more with that championship and make it mean something. And, you know, he could have. You know, as part of the Shield, I know he was not a singles guy. But the Shield was, if not the greatest act in the last five or six, maybe even ten years, I say. Um, I've always said they were the best stable since Evolution. And, I mean, it's hard to say, I mean, because all three guys are doing really well now. And we won't be able to really truly tell until a couple years down the line to see where all three guys end up. But right now, they're all flourishing the singles competitors for the most part. And they all won gold. They all had amazing matches, including on this show, Ambrose and Kingston having a good match. And um, Rollins and uh, Rollins and Reigns would have a good match later on, too, which I'll get to in a little bit. But, you know, still, I just, um, you know, I, I thought it was just weird. I thought it was weird that they didn't do more with these guys and um, give them a stipulation or something to work with. It was a good match, though. Ambrose winning the U.S. title made for a really cool moment. So up next, my least favorite matchup on the entire show Sheamus versus Mark Henry in a strap match. Now, I've never been a fan of strap matches. Um, I enjoyed, to an extent, the Cena-Rusev match from Sunday, from this past year. And it was a chain match, obviously. But basically the same exact fucking rules as a strap match. I did not like Punk and Umaga. I did not like... I especially did not like JTG and Shad from Extreme Rules 2010. And this match was really no exception. They just didn't have much chemistry at all. Um, you know, And it's a shame, because Sheamus and Mark Henry in my opinion, had a solid series of matches in that latter half of 2011 after Sheamus went babyface and Mark Henry was doing the whole Hall of Pain shtick. And they never really resolved that feud. You know, Mark Henry beat him by countout at SummerSlam in a pretty good match while it lasted. They had a match either that Friday or the following week. I think it was the following week. And Sheamus won that match by countout. And they never really did a rubber match. They never really went back to it. They had a few matches in 2012, but nothing that would wrap up the rivalry. You know, rivalry for uh, you know, for lack of a better term. So we get that feud. We get the revi- the revival of that rivalry on this show for no other no other reason that they really didn't have anything to do with either guy. Mark Henry, for whatever reason, won at WrestleMania against Ryback. And I like Mark Henry, but like I said in my WrestleMania 29 review, there was no reason for him to be winning that match unless he was going to be put in the WWE title picture, in which he wasn't. So that was a complete waste. And all of that momentum was put to waste in this feud with Sheamus, which ended up going nowhere. The feud sucked. Sheamus you know, made Mark Henry look, made, made him out to look like a complete pussy by um, beating him in all these stupid challenges and all this other stupid shit. Um, then we get the match, which was no good. The stipulation did them no favors. And then Sheamus won. So Mark Henry was, you know, took his ball and went home, as WWE said. And I think they said that because there was heat on him for something. I have no fucking idea. So he went he went home for a month and he ended up coming back for the whole um, fake retirement angle a month later, which was good, obviously. And, you know, a good way of bringing him back, which was amazing, obviously. But you know, this match was no good. And my least favorite part of the show, uh, just a bad match, no point for it to happen. And, you know, neither guy really went on to do anything. I mean, Mark Henry did. He should have won here. It, I know uh, they probably didn't know ahead of time, but it would have been nice if you know they knew ahead of time they were going to be putting Mark Henry in a feud with John Cena over the WWE Championship and have him win here. Because Sheamus winning here made no sense. I know it was his first pay per view win 
like fucking six months or something like that, but there was no reason for him to win this match considering the fact that, um, you know, he, he just didn't need to win. He did not need to win this match because he went on to do absolutely nothing. He was on the fucking <laughs> the, the pre-show the following month with uh, Damian Sandow, so no reason for Sheamus to be winning this matchup. Up next, an I Quit match between Alberto Drill and Jack Swagger. Um, and a number one contender is about to determine the and, and about to determine the number one contender to the World Heavyweight Championship. So the match as it was, it was well wrestled as we saw at WrestleMania. But again, I mean, it was hard to enjoy it knowing that originally we were gonna be getting that triple threat ladder match between Ziggler, who was the world heavyweight champion, um, and then Ziggler, Del Rio, and Swagger. And I know there were reports at the time, like, oh, don't worry, we're going to do the match anyway at SummerSlam or whatever. And they never did. Um, you know, sadly, we never ended up getting the triple threat match. It's not like three of the all-time greatest, you know, ladder match specialists of all time, and it would have been a one of the best bouts of the, of the century. Maybe it would have been, but it wasn't a dream bout, so to speak. But it would have been great, though, to see those three guys mix it up in a ladder match setting. So they, they changed the matchup, obviously, after Ziggler got hurt on SmackDown right before the pay-per-view after getting unintentionally hurt by Jack Swagger. Um, they changed the bout to a number one contenders match instead between Del Rio and Swagger and gave them an I Quit match stipulation instead. And I Quit matches can be good. I mean, there really haven't been many in recent years that I technically enjoyed. I have not seen Cena and Orton in full, but I did watch Cena and Miz from Over the Limit 2011 Batista and Cena from Over the Limit 2010. Um, what other matches? I know there's been other I Quit matches, but this match I didn't really... Like I, like I said, it was a well-wrestled matchup, and that's what kind of made their match at WrestleMania good. Nowhere near as great, but you know, nowhere near being the level of being you know great. But it was a well-wrestled, solid matchup. And that was kind of the same thing here, but do you want to quit? Do you want to quit? Do you want to quit by the referee and constantly putting the microphone in, in their faces and them you know, obviously saying no... You know, it gets to be a little annoying after a while, and that's what I never really liked about I Quit matches. And maybe there's a way they can restructure that to make it not as annoying. But yeah, never really, n- never really have been a huge fan of um, <clears throat> of I Quit matches. I thought this was good, was better than uh, was better than Cena and Miz and Cena and uh, Cena and Batista from a year from a few years prior. But uh, just not my favorite match on the show. Solid for what it was. Del Rio came out victorious, the new number one contender to the World Heavyweight Championship. And again, though, it was just kind of hard watching and thinking the latter match was what we were going to get instead. Like, imagine how great that match would have been, considering the fact, too, that all three guys are former Mr. Money in the Bank winners. Um, you know, uh, Swagger winning it in 2010, Del Rio winning it in 2011, and Ziggler winning it in 2012. So a perfect trifecta of former Mr. Money in the Bank winners. And unfortunately, we never got that match. Despite you know the reports of we're gonna do it at SummerSlam or whatever, Ziggler was out of title contention after after Money in the Bank. And Z- and Swagger would no- be nowhere near title contention for the next two years. The guy's on superstars now. Um, still a solid match. Not not too too great. Nothing exciting, but they made the most of the stipulation. There was like one point I think it came to the finish when I think Del Rio won with an instant replay or Swagger won, and they had to do an instant replay which was weird because we never really got much follow-up on that and they would never really incorporate the instant replay again after that point, so that was kind of random. But, uh, yeah, solid matchup, though. Up next, Tornado Tag Team match for the WWE Tag Team Championships with The Shield, Seth Rollins, and Roman Reigns collectively, um, taking on Team Hell No for the belts, Daniel Bryan and Kane. So, pretty nice matchup. Could have used some more time to be more special, and I thought the Tornado Tag Team match stipulation could have been more... Um, they could have made they, they could have made them more they they could have made more of that stipulation excuse me by kind of going more all out. And I know they had more matches on Raw and the pay per views and whatever else, but it would have been nice if we got more of that stipulation um, than what we did. I thought it was a really good match. It was, it was pretty standard for the most part. It wasn't as tornado as they would have thought it would have been. And by tornado, for those unfamiliar, is when there's you don't have to tag in and out. It's just kind of a free for all. But um, you, there's no legal man. You, whoever you pin. And you win the match for your team. So that's how tornado matches work. T- tornado tag team matches work. And that's kind of what we got essentially here. And a pretty good match. I mean, it wasn't great or anything like that. Pretty much my, my thoughts from the Ambrose Kingston match kind of echo the same here. And that I thought it was a pretty good match. Not amazing or anything, but it was pretty good. And it had the right finish. Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns emerging victorious to become the new WWE tag team titles to the Shield all golden. 
by the end of the night with the Shield winning all the championships, the United States title, and the tag team titles, in which they would hold both belts, I think, for the remember for, for the next five or six months. And, you know, it, it solidified in my brain here. And, I mean, it wouldn't be official until, like, the following year at Extreme Rules, but the Shield, in my mind, not only the best stable since Evolution, but the best stable ever. I mean, you know, better than Evolution, in my opinion. Not only because of the fact that they beat Evolution, but also due to the fact that, um, you know, they're just... All, all three of these guys are great. They had amazing matches and amazing run. I don't want to make this a, a Praise the Shield video. I mean, you already know enough about the Shield to know that they're amazing and how fantastic they were. But even the aftermath and the way they were built up, the debut, the matches, the accolades, everything. You know, the way these guys were booked what was phenomenal. And I absolutely loved it. So, good victory for the Shield here, winning all the gold by the end of the night. And probably one of the more noteworthy parts of this show. There weren't many noteworthy aspects of this show, but this was definitely part of it. This was definitely um, one aspect of the show that I really enjoyed was the Shield walking out with all the gold, the United States title and the Tag Team titles. Great booking. So up next, Randy Orton versus The Big Show in Extreme Rules match. Pretty good matchup, almost exactly like Roman Reigns versus Big Show from this past Sunday. You know, the best Big Show match I had seen in quite some time. I enjoyed Big Show and Sheamus from Hell in a Cell 2012. But I thought this match was maybe not as good as that, but I still thought it was, had, was a lot better than it had any right to be. Um, they made the most of the 13 minutes they were granted, kind of going all out, incorporating steel steps and uh, steel chairs and a table and all this other crazy stuff. And I thought it was a really entertaining match. Maybe if it wasn't because it, maybe it beca if it wasn't because of uh, the show emanating from Orton's back, you know, backyard hometown of St. Louis, maybe it wouldn't have been as good. But that audience was rabid for Randy Orton. They were red hot for him and made for a great environment during this matchup. Throughout most of the show, but especially during this matchup, the hometown hero, Randy Orton conquering Big Show. And it wasn't like it was the greatest feud in the world either. They just kind of threw it together right after WrestleMania to give both guys something to do. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm no Big Show fan. I'm pretty sure that's well documented. But Orton got a really, really good... A really, really good match out of Big Show on this show. And Big Show held his own. I don't want to give all the credit to Randy Orton. But it was easily the best Big Show match I'd seen in quite some time. And still to this day. And like I said, very similar to Roman Reigns in the Big Show from this past Sunday. This, the best Big Show match I've probably seen since since that match with Randy Orton at Extreme Rules. And it's crazy too. Because you think, you know, they had a really good match on this show. But then you fast forward maybe six months or so to Survivor Series. When these two face each other in the main event for the WWE title. In an atrocious matchup, like one of the worst main events in recent history. Like, I thought that was horrendous. Uh, and I thought this was a complete 180. I thought this was a lot better than it had any right to be because the feud wasn't really there. These guys never really had much chemistry to before. But you put them together in an Extreme Rules match. The timing was right. The place was right. And you get a very entertaining Extreme Rules matchup. And the best part about the matchup for me, which I thought this was great and a great touch, Orton, after maybe an RKO or two, Puts out Big Show, and he just couldn't put him away. Big Show kicks out at two. And then Orton's thinking to himself, how can I put away this giant? So he thinks to himself for a moment, and then kind of rolls his eyes back to the back of his head, backs up into the corner, the place goes nuts, and he's setting up the punt kick, and which had not been seen for maybe a year or two. I don't know when the last time Orton punts, punted somebody. Maybe in late 2011. I can't remember exactly. But I do know that in the spring of 2012, the move was banned because of concussion awareness, blah, 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 blah. But I love the punt kick, and a lot of people call it reckless, and it is. But it's a guilty pleasure of mine. I always thought that was a sweet move. And he brought it back out of the dead for this matchup. And again, like I said in my Extreme Rules 2012 review, that's what should kind of... I mean, I know this is an Extreme Rules match and not no holds part, but that's what kind of should differ each match type. A street fight should be a street fight. Extreme Rules should be in kind of incorporating like SVR style by pulling stuff out from underneath the ring and then uh, using it against their opponent, whatever. And then for these kind of matches, for a no-holds-barred match or something like that, legitimately lives up to the name of their no-holds being barred. You know, So I thought that was great. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm really hoping, and I'm not looking forward to it, what am I saying? But if they could do that in the future. But I, what I'm trying to say is that I loved, I actually just got a text, and that's why I got confused for a second. I got distracted. My phone just went, um, someone just texted me. Oops. <laughs> but anyway, that's a, a, a plus journalism here, people. I know you can't see me, and you can only hear my voice. And um, you don't know that I'm botching, but I am. In between, I, I, I am uh, 
Um, I'm botching my lines here. But nevertheless, getting back to what I was saying before, Big Show and Orton, a really good match. Love the finish with Orton, you know, resorting back to that punt kick for this one match. And the only other time we would see it again, also against Big Show at Survivor Series. Um, and again, a terrible matchup. <laughs> but a really good finish with Orton busting out the punt kick. So I thought that was a great finish, and the crowd went rabid for it. I went crazy when he brought back the punt kick. And an awesome moment. He connected, picked up the win. The crowd loved every moment of it. They ate it all up, and I did too. Up next, last man standing match with the WWE title between John Cena and Ryback. And you talk about matches that had no right being good. And I did not think that Cena and Ryback would have the chemistry that they did. I mean, it was no it, it was no Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. There was no Stone Cold and Rock or anything like that. But, you know, Ryback works best or works best when he has the best opponents. You know, like in a CM Punk or... And even their matches weren't that great. But he has to work well with these different guys. Like, the match with Mark Henry was a massive disappointment. And, you know, John Cena, the whole you can't wrestle bullshit, I cringe when people chant that. The guy put those rumors to rest, put those chants to rest years ago. You know, much less in 2013 um, when he's having really good matches with Ryback and even Mark Henry, of all people. At Money in the Bank a couple of months later. But a really, really good last man standing match, and I've talked about this before too, that I'm not always a fan of last man standing matches. I can find them boring at times. I mean, granted, the one between Big Show and uh, Del Rio from this past week, from this you know past Sunday, I thought was great. I really enjoyed that one. And this one was kind of the same thing. Ryback kind of treated like a beast, you know, taking out John Cena and Cena kind of fighting back, the resilient baby face, whatever. Really good back and forth bout. Um, that I was into. I was heavily interested in. You knew that Ryback wasn't going to win the belt. John Cena had just won the championship at WrestleMania. So you knew Ryback wasn't going to win. But the finish was cool, though. I liked the finish. Ryback couldn't win. Um, he couldn't lose either. He had just turned heel, and having him lose here decisively would have killed any momentum he had just built up for himself, if any at all, but whatever. Um, so the finish I thought was really, really good, and that he speared John Cena. He, he spine-bustered him through the cell wall. Um, cell wall or whatever it was. Not... Cell wall, I'm, I'm saying that like he spine-bustered someone through their body, <laughs> through someone's body or something like that, through the um, stage wall, through the Titantron wall, whatever you want to call it. He did that at the top of the stage, made for a great visual, this whole explosion, and it went to a draw. So it kind of shades of the last man standing match between Undertaker and Batista from back last 2007 where you couldn't really pick a winner, so you have it end in a draw. You can't do that too often, but when done sparringly, it works. And I thought it worked here, setting up the subsequent matchup at um, at Payback 2013. So I thought that was good. So I, I thought this was a really, really good match. I love the finish. In-ring action was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. And it furthered the feud nicely. No decisive finish, you know, like I said before, but it was effective in protecting both guys going into the next pay-per-view for their three stages of hell match at Payback 2013. So we get to the main event, Steel Cage match between Brock Lesnar and Triple H. Both guys are one for one at this point. Triple H beating Lesnar at SummerSlam. Triple H beating uh, Lesnar. Lesnar beating Triple H at SummerSlam. Triple H beating Lesnar at WrestleMania 2009. Or 29, excuse me, not 2009. Um, 2013, WrestleMania 29. So we get to the rubber match on this show. And the feud was good. I enjoyed the feud that these guys had. It went on way too fucking long. A lot longer than it should have. Because if you think about it, this feud at this point had been going for a year. It was the night after Extreme Rules in 2012 that Lesnar attacked Triple H. And they built up to their match at SummerSlam. And then their match at WrestleMania. And then this rematch, which I guess they wanted to give Lesnar his win back. I don't know. Why not Why not just end the feud after the SummerSlam match? You know, it's not like their matches were great enough to the point where they had to be done again. You know, I thought their SummerSlam match was solid. Not great, but solid. Um, I would put in the top 25 best matches of that year, but at 25, no higher than that. Um, their WrestleMania match was better. I enjoyed that matchup. The crowd was fucking dead for it after, you know, after the Punk and Taker match. Absolutely dead for it. But again, an entertaining match. This was easily the best of their series. It wasn't a fantastic match, but it, like I said, from Lesnar and Triple H standards, from them, from a working together standpoint, it was pretty damn good. And I, I really enjoyed it. The interference from Paul Heyman was kind of predictable with him. I think he put in the sledgehammer or something like that, or he incorporated the steel chair. He put that in the equation, 
whatever. I didn't think that was a huge deal because even in recent years, I and mean, this has been the case for God knows how long, that still cage matches don't mean anything, you know? So interference, I mean, nowadays when it happens with Candy the Authority or the Wyatt family, it doesn't make it any more acceptable, but you know, I've just come to expect it because WWE's done it so many times and it kind of takes away from the steel cage stipulation when you see all this fucking interference and it doesn't mean anything because the steel cage, in my opinion, should be the match to end all feuds with. And I mean, it ended this feud, but it, it it's supposed to keep out people from interfering. That's the whole point of the cage. And we didn't get that on this show. We got... We got the interference from Tripoli. We got the interference from Paul Heyman. Like, not as bad in recent years with the Wyatt family and the authority, whatever. Um, so it was not too terrible, and it played into the matchup. It helped it, if anything. I think it helped the matchup. But you know, just the notion that there's interference, outside interference, in a steel cage match, or even a Hell in a Cell match to that, to that effect, is ridiculous, and it completely kills the stipulation. That said, though, I thought the action was very entertaining. As I said before, the best bout these two ever had. And Lesnar going over decisively, picking up the victory, and ending the feud 2-1. to one. So another loss for Lesnar at WrestleMania that was kind of unnecessary. The only other pinfall loss he has gotten in WWE, other than his loss at, um, at uh, Extreme Rules 2012 against John Cena the year prior. Two very unnecessary losses. Lesnar should have been undefeated from the moment he came back in 2012 to now. And unless he lost along the way, like last year or something, the guy really should have been kept undefeated, unpinned, or whatever, in my opinion. But regardless, um, the match was really, really good. Really good match between these two. Best match they had. A good way of closing off the show. And what I was saying before. Oh, it would continue Lesnar's momentum going on his feed with CM Punk that summer. And it would also kind of, you know, the WWE, I never really saw it this way, but WWE kind of attributes, you know, cites this matchup as the reason why. Triple H eventually broke down and became a corporate guy. I mean, I know he was the part of the he was a COO of the company, um, dating back to 2011. But they say that you know the loss in this matchup, the devastation from this loss, kind of messed with him a little bit, made him more corporate, kind of had him break down and uh, whatever. You know, he had to be helped out of this out, out of the ring by some officials, and the whole thing with Curtis Axel happened the next night on Raw when he lost to him, or he debuted, and he got the uh, concussion, or whatever it was, it was weird, but you know, they kind of cite this matchup as the reason why uh, Brock Lesnar would eventually, or excuse me, Triple H would eventually join the authority, or be a part of the authority, turn heel, whatever, so it was kind of interesting, it was kind of noteworthy in that respect, but on the whole though, I thought it was a really good show, start to finish, a lot of awesome matches, a lot of awesome entering action, some entertaining bouts, I thought, um, the Shield winning the gold, easily the most noteworthy part about the show. The um, Not the sole highlight, but I thought it was the best part about the show. Or in a big show, and Cena and Ryback having better matches than I thought they would. Lesnar and Triple H, a very solid matchup. Jericho and Fandango, another nice matchup in the opener too. Sheamus and Henry, a complete waste of time. I did not enjoy that. And then the I Quit match was really good as well. So on the whole, really enjoyable show. Continuing the strong streak of great Extreme Rules pay-per-views. The theme was great, too. Live It Up by, I want to say, Airborne was a nice theme, too, for this show. So that also kind of enhanced my experience of watching this event. But um, really good show, though. Very much enjoyed it. And you can check it out on the WWE Network for only $9.99 or for free for the month of Mar May, I guess. For this, um, for the month of May, it is now free for all new subscribers. Whatever. I've been a loyal subscriber since day one. I'm not getting my compensation, but no complaints from me. You, if you can watch shows like this, then it's worth it. $9.99 or free, it is absolutely worth it. So that's going to do it, folks, for my review of Extreme Rules 2010. You can find me on Facebook at GrahamGSMMatthews at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Make sure to tweet me on Twitter with your thoughts on this review in the show at WrestleRant and also in the comments section down below. Make sure to comment, like, share, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. And as I said at the start of the video, I'll be back on Tuesday with my final installment in the Extreme Rules reviews. And as I mentioned earlier, no review of Extreme Rules 2015, or at least not right now. Maybe next year. I like to have that year threshold. You know, to do things two weeks in retrospect is not the same. I like to talk about the aftermath too. And you can't really get that um, when you're two weeks removed from a pay-per-view. So I'm not talking about 2015. But Tuesday is the Extreme Rules 2014 review. And then starting next weekend, my reviews of Judgment Day, I think maybe 98, whatever the first installment was, onward to 2009. So a lot of awesome reviews coming up. Make sure to stay tuned for that. 
Have a great weekend, folks. Have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome month of May. And I'll catch you guys down the road.